Hey, my mouse is going here. Uh, I'm John Strickland. I'm a member of the Mars Society, a member of the National Space Society Board of Directors, and the National Space Society Awards Chair. But I've been spending a lot of time on actual uh, concepts for space operations. And we're working since 2010 uh, on a concept they call Access to Mars. And the first concept was just to prove we started the project to simply prove that a, uh, that a vehicle uh, at Mars, could, a, a reusable ferry, could operate between Mars orbit and Mars surface. So once we got, we had a major breakthrough in October 2010. And uh, since then, I've been working on the concept to how you support, the, how you actually get to Mars, how large would the program be, and how would it be integrated into all the other parts of the space program. So that's more of the basis on what, on what we're going to do today. Uh, the first part of this presentation will be more thinking, and then we'll get into a lot of images to actually show you what it looks like, how it would actually work, based on, on the thinking. Yeah, go, go to the next one. Okay, so I think a lot of you have seen the Falcon uh, rocket taking off. There's going to be a big change, and launch prices are going to come down drastically as rockets become partly reusable and then fully reusable. Next. So here we'll have the new space program. I have to say new space with emphasis. Uh, fully reusable rocket boosters and capsules. Rapid, reliable, and inexpensive launches to low Earth orbit. Integrated space transportation system with vehicles and logistics. Reusable in-space vehicles. Cryogenic propellant depots. Unpressurized docking facilities for, for cargo vehicles. Robots and rails to do uh, assembly of stuff in space and logistic uh, uh, manipulation and transfer of cargoes in vacuum, and much larger total expedition masses and capabilities. So the big deal is we've been stuck with this low mass, high launch cost thing for like the since the space program started. And the various political factors that the, in, the introduction of reusable rockets has been delayed. That is now out of the government's hands. The government cannot anymore stop the introduction of, of reusable rockets. We are just months away from the first reusable rocket landing, and certainly less than a year away, maybe only six months away from the first reusable orbital rocket to take off again with a payload a second time. I was at the Delta Clipper's second launch, which was the first time a rocket took off again. That was a, a large rocket. Next. So, what are we going to do if we have this new capability? We, we want to avoid using the Apollo mission model. Mission avoid, avoid single destination programs and goals. We try to make all the vehicles in the program reusable. We create a set of common components to keep the cost down. We rely heavily on private companies to design, develop, and construct vehicles with minimal NASA oversight. NASA gives them it defines what it wants the vehicles to do. It doesn't tell the company how to build the vehicle. Create a unified space transportation architecture and management to guide the program with the heavy involvement of private companies. Using the existing space station, which is critical, as a place to develop and test vehicles and equipment for beyond low Earth orbit operations. And we remember that space development will assist Space exploration next. So we want to abandon the Apollo mission model because they don't leave any physical improvements by. You don't advance with a Apollo mission model. You have a little capsule that goes out, comes back with a few rocks, and you throw away the rock and the capsule. It's like a, having a train without a station or a truck without a cargo loading yard and, and gas stations. And space logistics, that is the handling of the equipment and cargo, is not possible. And it creates a much higher risk of space radiation. Next. Access to Mars mission architecture uses liquid chemical propellant as the primary propulsion method. That's not the only viable method of reaching Mars. So what we're presenting this here to show there's at least one way 
of doing this. There are probably other viable ways of doing it. The two significant alternatives are nuclear, thermal, and electric propulsion. Next. Okay, so, so this is a big controversial section. Some people believe that, that ultimate propulsion methods would delay the first human Mars mission. This can be a very legitimate concern. The rational approach should be continue to develop these alternative missions and to develop chemical rocket propulsion. And when we're ready to go to Mars, we go to Mars with what we have at that time, given that we have to have an advance like five years before the decision point to, to focus on the development of one method. So the date for an initial human Mars mission should not be delayed more than six months by decisions supporting an alternative propulsion system. Next. Okay, then we got the planetary tug of war. It was, so we have moon versus Mars versus asteroids or, or robots only. And the split and go makes the, the space community appear as it really is to be divided by politicians and the media and the public. So the integrated space transportation architecture is based on the cislunar transportation concept. Cislunar is not lunar centric. It's simply near the moon. L1 and L2 points. Next. Cislunar does not favor the moon over Mars. Mars missions have been now used in liquid cryogenic propellants. A large supply of liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, is needed at L1 and L2. All the fuel can come from the Earth, but it takes like 20 times more energy to get the fuel to the moon to L1 from the Earth and the moon, even if you're using reusable vehicles. So the issues are, does the cost of developing a lunar mining base exceed the extra cost of using the fuel from the Earth? And how much would developing the lunar mining base delay the first that Mars expedition? My opinion, uh, the, if you're going to the moon first, it should not delay the initial Mars mission for more than three years, or you should go ahead and start developing the plan to use a uh, propellant delivered from the Earth. Next. So what is this lunar space? I think a lot of you know what it is. It's all the objects around, including the moon's orbit and all Earth moon like ranging points. The distances are uh, measured more in size of the required velocity changes and by transit time. It's up maybe the maximum would be maybe a week or two, maybe a few days. Uh, transit times by electric driver many months long. Uh, the cislunar transportation system will extend automatically beyond cislunar space to the nearest asteroids of Mars. Next, there's a diagram of cislunar space, and the points in question now to us is this is a space colony, they're still fine for space colonies, but these are good for, for the points to leave for Mars. Next. And these are some of the delta V values. To get from Earth uh, uh, into orbit is al almost 10 kilometers per second. Getting up to uh, 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 L1 can take you about, uh, let's see, L1, yeah, it's about almost 4 kilometers per second. And to get back, if you use air capture, is about 0.77 kilometers per second. And L1 to Mars, uh, to escape velocity, is 140 meters per second. And uh, to Mars transit or uh, trajectory is a point a little under a kilometer to up to two kilometers per second, depending on which year you leave. Next. Okay. Uh, so we want to, this is a list of all the things we need, including uh, pro pro propellant depots, which are need a sunshade, a super insulation, and a cryocooler to keep the liquids from boiling away. And you'd be developed, developed delivering propellants by tankers, which themselves would have to be uh, uh, cryogenically protected, that is, super insulation and so forth. Next. So there's a cryogenic propellant depot with the sunshade, has super insulation, and the solar panels uh, power a cryo cooler, which simply keeps the, cold, the fuel cold. It doesn't take much power to keep it from boiling away. It's called ZBO, zero boil off tradition. Next. Okay, transportation network consists of vehicles and infrastructure that has bases or nodes. You, if you had a, 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 a highway 
and no gas stations. What good would the highway do? Unless you have horses, I guess. So the network consists of both vehicles to move between the stationary nodes and bases, and also the logistics bases or way stations. The vehicles support the nodes with supplies, and the nodes support the vehicles with fuel. So it's an interdependent system. I'll go ahead next. Okay, the, the L1 base, a logistics base location, is very advantageous. 140 meters per second to leave in any direction. Uh, you're free from all the artificial space debris. It can't stay there. It goes bye bye. The ferry base at L1 can reach any point in the moon in 12 hours, and it can return in 12 hours. It has a 24 7 sunlight uh, as an energy supply. No uh, thermal fluctuations. It, th it is outside the magnetosphere, so you would be exposed to the full force of, of solar proton storms. Next. Okay. This is describing where some of the, where some of the pathways are. Uh, so, logistics consists of the movement of vehicles, cargo, passengers, and propellants to and from transfers at these various locations. Vehicles need stations, and stations need vehicles. Next. Okay, um, let's see. That's what you need to, to do a, 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 a high mass space operation. You need the cargo crew and tanker vehicles. You need a small uh, way station in, in a low Earth orbit, it mainly is a transshipment point because you don't want to accumulate stuff there because of the space debris. You want the, the vehicles to go from low Earth orbit to O1 and back again using air capture on the return to safe power. Uh, at, at L1, you need a large uh, 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 station, uh, twice as large as all the other ones. The current one has like, I don't know, like about 50 diamond stations, something like that. Because uh, you have to, so you have to have, you have places for all the Mars vehicles to dock, all the lunar vehicles to dock, and all the low Earth orbit to L1 vehicles to dock. So you've got depots, docking positions, Crew modules with heavy radiation shielding because you're not going anywhere. And uh, docking also for all the Mars vehicles. So the lunar propellant option supply is used. You need a, a lunar polar mining base to provide propellant for Mars. And, and so you have vehicles going from the lunar surface to L1 and back again, delivering propellant. Initially, the vehicles would be delivering supplies for the base from L1 down to the moon. Again, that's 12 hours using a fully reusable uh, lunar uh, ferry. Next. So expeditions at a larger scale for robust lunar and Mars missions. We're talking about thousands of tons, not hundreds of tons, which would be required for, for a really, really robust mission. All of such a mission mass would need to be launched within a year or two. You can't spend a decade launching your expedition mass into space. I think you have to be able to do it with a reusable rocket, which can be launched at least once a week. If you can launch a rocket once a week, you can do it. Even maybe even two weeks, but not once every two years. Uh, you probably see most of my articles on, on, a, on the Speech Review blasting the, the setup launch system, or as we call it, the Franken rocket, because it keeps rising from the depth. Uh, if space pr launch prices drop by 90% at least, Due to reusable vehicles, we can launch these larger mission masses for the same cost as a current program or less. Reusing in space vehicles also reduces launch costs because you don't have to keep relaunching another vehicle every time you want to use one in space. Mass production of vehicles with common components and parts would also reduce costs. Next. Crew transport is not only is not a viable option for future expeditions because you also need cargo. If you see any human operation on, on the Earth other than passenger planes, the cargo is a major part of all the mass. If you're doing Antarctica, the, 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 the weight of all the habitats and so on is vastly more than the weight of all the people. So again, it's people like, like a highway system only using passenger cars and buses with no trucks. So despite planetary expeditions, you need crew cargo and propellants, all of them. And it needs to be delivered in space vehicles to in space locations. 
Highlights cause the primary reason for the past lack of cargo vehicles in space times because they're heavy. Next, the same passengers, vehicles, and so on can be carried on more than one vehicle. This implies a transfer of passengers, cargo, and fuel from one vehicle to another. So you need a station, a base, a way station. Um, and it's, it's important. You want to have it firmly docked so it can't float away. You can't move during the loading and loading process. The same is true in space. Next. So some objects will be larger than a habitat. You can't put these inside a habitat. They're too big. These include uh, cargo ferries, depots, large cargo containers, and large propulsion units. These could be more than 15 meters in diameter and could mass more than 225 tons. Next. So the docking trust facility is simply, the, here's the problem, it's, it, that's at the bottom of the slide. If you try to launch a truss and a rocket, it's a joke. It's, a, it's balloon cargo. You can only launch a total, a tiny fraction of the rocket's ability because the truss is mostly empty space in the middle, right? So it's called balloon cargo. So the docking truss is a rectangular cross section truss with docking positions not along one or more sides of the truss. These are intended for use by non pressurized cargo vehicles, cargo carriers, or fuel depots simply so they can dock someplace and they don't drift away. They also would be supplied with power and data communications. The pressurized <coughs> vehicles could dock in an emergency, but you couldn't open the hatch. Next. Okay. So here's an example of, of a docking truss. This is at the L1 station. And you see the robot there uh, being able to, because it's anchored to a point, it has leverage. So the robot can grab a cargo out of one vehicle, move along the truss, and stuff the cargo into another vehicle. Next. So <coughs> why docking disks are surround each docking mechanism? So if you have a real narrow twig, you can break that twig easily. But if you have a wider attachment point, it's harder to break off something. To, to protect the docking positions, I, I use docking disks, which provide mechanical support to uh, avoid breakage if something bumps one of the dock vehicles from the side. Next. And so here's a look at some of the, at the vehicles docked the truss. And you can see a few of the docking disks there. Those typically disks are at least that the, the, the uh, tunnel to them would be a minimum of four feet wide. What? Oh, two minutes left? Yes. Okay, that's good. Uh, and that the disc would be about uh, up maybe eight meters across, with the uh, mechanism being about six feet across. Next. Okay, so this is basically like hell on wheels in space. It's a railhead. The robot builds the truss out of parts, brought up. It attaches the docking discs to the truss. It attaches, the, it connects the power cables and it uses the, its own rails. It attaches rails to the truss. It moves along the truss on the rails as it goes so it has access to the entire truss. Next. And there's an example of a roller coaster bogey that keeps the, uh, the robot on wheels from, from uh, drifting off with the rails. Next. There's a diagram of the same kind of thing in space you, uh, on, on the uh, on, on the diving press. Next, okay. This this is like a seed because uh, if you have a diving press with a robot on rails, if you additional vehicles can dock with it, and with the materials in the additional vehicles, you can build a structure of almost unlimited size because you can continue to build the truss and the structures around it bigger and bigger. Go ahead. Next. Okay. Um, so this is the doctor press is a robot arm, this is the equivalent of a port in a loading facility. It becomes a transshipment site. Next. Next. Okay, I'll let's skip the past the one that Dexter did show the picture of Dexter. Next. That's what Dexter looks like. And it's got two arms. One arm can hold the tool, another arm can hold the workpiece that it's working on. Next. Okay, so here's here's the logistics space. So what you're looking at is a docking truss at the left with a lot of vehicles attached at the right. You've got lunar, lunar ferries at the left 
you know, some of the Mars equipment on the right, and the far right is the crew quarters. Uh, the, the, the truss itself is, is uh, 50 meters wide, several hundred uh, feet long. Uh, the, the crew clusters at the right, each can is five meters in diameter, slightly larger than the space station modules next. And that's a, on the that one is a go back up and keep asking. That one's in lower orbit. Oh, don't bother. That's fine. Uh, so here we've got this is how you build the docking truss. You start with, with a great big uh, 50 meter uh, wide by 20 meter long uh, cargo can uh, carrier canister. It's like a supersized cargo container. Uh, it has all the stuff here, including the robot. So go to the next one. And so the robot's inside. Next. The robot comes out and starts building the truss. Next. Now you've got this main significant section of truss built. It's just tube and socket. It looks like a dicker joint. It locks together. Next. So now you've added the robot. It has added uh, six docking positions on the first section of truss. Next. Now vehicles are now able to dock at those docking positions. Next. And the robot can now access the additional uh, truss parts in the next cargo uh, carrier that's been docked. The other three are propulsion units or reusable upper stages, and it can continue building the truss. Next. So we can finish the workstation. We need some additional components the main solar array, additional crew hab units, the energy control, depots, storage containers, uh, and so on. Next. So there's a completed, uh, uh, there's a completed uh, way station or logistics space at L1. That's basically empty. It's ready for all the other vehicles to start using it. Uh, you can see the large cargo containers. In this case, there's only one crew cluster. Uh, the crew clusters provide radiation protection with the six cylinders surrounding the crew cluster are accessible to the crew. Five minutes. Uh, but the, the, the central uh, 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 can has at least a, a half meter thick water jacket all the way around it to protect the crew from, from additional radiation because water is a better insulator than metal because it's lighter atoms. Uh, next. Okay, so then you start, all these various vehicles start arriving and the lunar ferries start bringing lunar propellant up from the lunar, from the lunar pole to build the thing. Next. And you can also, if we can build an electric tug, a set maybe of 20 or 30 electric tugs and create a pipeline, you can move a lot of your liquid propellants and other heavy cargo to L1 in a tiny fraction of the cost without using all the liquid propellant that you'd have to bring up from the earth. That we think this can be done, but we, you know, I, I'm, I'm in the process of researching this right now. Uh, next. Okay, so to go to Mars, we're going to use uh, liquid chemical rockets to, to put the rockets into Mars transit. But when, as you reach Mars, you're going to be using uh, aero, the aero capture maneuver to save about two to three kilometers per second of delta V, which means a lot of propellant we're going to save, because those, those 100 foot wide uh, air shells or aero shields are much lighter than the equivalent amount of fuel needed to break the vehicle into orbit. So you're using Mars atmosphere as, a, as an air brake, in effect, to slow down. And the robot is busy assembling those. They're brought up in sections inside one of the uh, cargo containers. And the robot assembles them because they're two-dimensional. They're designed to be assembled. Next. And there's a look at the crew quarters. You can see the cans in the center is where the crew would be. And at the top uh, right are the are the Mars cargo ferry stopped. Uh, and there's a close up view of the uh, docking discs with the opening in the center, which would be, could be occupied if it was a pressurized position by a, by a tunnel for astronauts and stuff to go through. Next. And there's another view of the same thing. Next. Okay, this is all about flags and footprints. This is why we create the whole thing. Uh, to avoid flags and footprints, you want a fully reusable system. So every vehicle you see in this presentation is completely reusable. Next. So the rationale for a robust mission, you have a larger crew for safety, 
and a wider skill set. You've got redundancy vehicles and equipment. Uh, the current mission model is about 4,000 tons of vehicles and equipment requires a minimum of 1,000 tons of repellent to be stored at L1 before the, before the fleet leaves for Mars. It creates and maintains permanent orbit and surface spaces on Mars with the first expedition. The next. Okay, this goes over the business of a composite vehicle versus a fleet. But we're using a fleet in this case. Next. If you have an electric drive, you can go back to a composite vehicle. In fact, a composite vehicle, uh, such as the entire logistics space, could be pushed to Mars by an electric vehicle because there's no stress on it. Next. Okay, the Mars fleet is, a, it's, as I said, about 40,000 tons, but there's a variety of vehicles. You've got crew mount vehicles, ferries, fuel depots, and racks of payloads. Next. And this costs about the minimum size. So the total land and cargo capacity of this mission is 625 tons of equipment, usable equipment on the surface, not including the mass of the vehicles, which come and go. Next. And that will go to the next one. Go ahead. Okay, this is talked about L1 as a means of accumulating vehicles and accumulating fuel in a safe location. Next. And this eliminates the need for pre-positioning equipment at Mars because when you're at Mars, the crew can operate the robots in direct, in real time, and or teleoperation. Next. So there is the vehicles about to leave from Mars from L1 to L1. Next. So we'll just go, out, go to the next slide because we're running out of time. We've got 22 separate vehicles. We've got 10 Mars ferries. Total larger vehicles, a total mass for thousand tons. The vehicles carry their own robot arms. Next. So there's an example of during transit where the two of the crew clusters have docked themselves together after being launched into transit. So the crew can outwork as a team during during the mission. And you see a bunch of other vehicle vehicles approaching Mars. As soon as they get a little you know, pretty soon within the next day, they're all going to have to be uh, Every single vehicle will have to be sheltered behind one of the heat shields, so everything has to be reconfigured. This is a reconfigurable fleet. Go ahead, next. And there's the fleet approaching Mars. Okay, there. And so now, now we're in the uh, uh, air capture configuration, except that crew cluster still has to retract its solar panels, otherwise they'd be melted. Next. And this talks about using air capture. And at Mars, and I mentioned that already, it saves a huge mass of propellant. Next. And this is more of a technical description. Go ahead, next one. This shows how you make a single pass to the atmosphere, not a series of passes. You go about 50 kilometers high. Once you get up back to 400 kilometers above Mars, you do an 80 meter per second orbit trim, which raises the peri axis out of the atmosphere. If you, if you go back into the atmosphere a second time, you're toast. Okay, so you don't want to do that. There is a, a large vehicle uh, doing an air capture. And the next next slide is a ferry doing an air capture. These are slides from other artists, but they illustrate it pretty well. So this explains a lot to the long, long Mars orbit go on. The next one, how much time? About one minute? Oh, we're done. Okay, just go, go next. I'll go over it real sure. fast. Go next. Okay. This is repeating the same sequence in low Mars orbit. Next, building the truss. Next, there's the completed Mars low Mars orbit station. Once you're at this point, you're ready. Uh, and so the whole point of this thing is think reusable. Next, and so I put the the Matryoshkas in here uh, to rub the engineers' noses in the fact that they insist on, on using expendable vehicles. Next. And so this is the case for usable ferries. Next, this gives the mass of the ferry. You've got a 30-ton drive ferry. It has a payload of 25 tons. Because it's got a really wide, 50-foot wide base, you know, it only needs 50 tons of repellent to land on Mars. Next. And there's the ferry. And there's a, a truck that's already come down, unloading a cargo container, showing whatever you can put in the container right inside the cargo bay. Of that ferry, it's 50 feet across the base, but it only weighs 50 tons. 
and it's hydrogen oxygen. You can get, uh, with this ferry, you can, when you fill it with propellant, you can put 20 tons of fuel in the tanks as, as payload and 75 tons as propellant. And with that 15 tons, you get up in orbit, you come back down with another payload. Next. And that's the inside with the hydrogen at the top and the oxygen and the, and the carbon at the bottom, which is heavy. Next, this, this is another whole show. I, get, I got a, a printout or a, a link to that if anyone wants to see the original show, which is 109 slides. So go ahead, that's the, that's the crew ferry, that's the propellant and dry mass and, and carbon mass. Next, go on past that one, next, past that one. Once you go to Mars, let's keep going to Mars. So we want to, that's the last slide. So, we want, to, we want to create capability for continuing main Mars expedition. So let's use the time for the first Mars expedition, making sure that once we go there, we can afford to keep going there. That's, that's the end of the talk. So, any questions? Man, that's a lot of information. Yeah, I know. I've been, I've been working on this for four years. This is wonderful stuff. See, so it's based on, you've got to have reusable rockets. You've got to have reusable heavy lifting, like I just talked about. He mirrored my position exactly like about an hour ago when he pointed out that we do need a heavy lift launch vehicle. We simply need to have a reusable heavy lift launch vehicle. And within about three or four years, Musk is going to produce one for us without the government being able to stop it. <laughs> Any other questions? I, now, I have up here at front a few copies left of my article list, which has links to the uh, Access to Mars website, which is 109 slides. That's, that show is three years old. And so if you look at it, it's all the details of how the Mars ferry system works. It, but the first part of the show starts in North orbit instead of L1. So the first part is out of date. The second part is still pretty much up to date. Thank you.